First of all, I feel humbled and honored by this invitation for more reasons than one, which are mostly private, so I will desist from explaining that at this stage. Secondly, it gives me great pleasure, but I'll just like to point out that in the brief given to me, it was Sabarmati, uh, Shantiniketan, and Oroville, not Sri Aurobindo Ashram. Sri Aurobindo Ashram, Pondicherry, and Oroville are just 10 kilometers geographically apart, but poles apart in terms of vision and in terms of what they stand for. If we go back to some kind of philosophical uh, underpinnings, then probably Sri Aurobindo's message on the day of, that India became independent, the 15th of August, 1947, he underlined five of his life's key dreams, one of them being the independence of India, and he felt that India partitioned was really half of the fruit, and India had to get away from partition and get back to unifying itself. The second was what he called the resurgence and liberation of the peoples of Asia, and he already said that much of it has happened, and we've seen over the last many odd years that has happened. A third was that the India spiritual message of the world would reach. It had started probably in a big way with Swami Vivekananda in Chicago in 1893, and it has continued ever since. The other two dreams are human unity, that Sri Aurobindo underlined, and the way of elevating humanity, or at least a large section of humanity, to a nobler new species. It is for these two separate ideologies, or not aims perhaps, that Oroville number one and Sri Aurobindo Ashram Pondicherry number two stand for. Sri Aurobindo Ashram Pondicherry does not have a date of inception, but informally it's considered the 24th of November 1926 when the mother and Sri Aurobindo had their Siddhi or what is called the Siddhi day and became one of the Darshan days. Whereas Oroville was initiated or formally inaugurated in 1968 on 28th February. In that sense, it's not in the same league as either Sabarmati or Shantiniketan. First of all, Sri was not physically there. Secondly, it embodied a dream of his, but it was the last five years of the mother's physical life. So in that sense, it was very different. The the, the kind of uh, what we are hearing from uh, Martin about Shanti Niket and Sabarmati doesn't hold good here. Mother did guide Oroville for the first five years physically, and then it was different. But what I'll say this is when it started, it started with a bang. It started with the soil of 128 nations and all the states of India as on that date being put into an urn at the center of Oroville near a banyan tree on the 28th of February, 1968. And that became the center of Oroville. Then the next thing was the mother spoke. She didn't come from a room in Pondicherry, but she spoke and she said greetings from Oroville to all men of goodwill. And then she outlined an Oroville charter. So this presentation works at some stage. I'll show it to you. It's very interesting because the aims of Oroville are clearly outlined there. So the other thing that's very interesting is that Oroville, when the mother started it, it's, it's therefore, you know, there are the rules that govern, and even in the mother's time, the rules that governed Oroville and the rules that governed Sri Aurobindo Ashram were very, very different. And this was actually a kind of city life of 50,000 residents being planned out where human unity would be experimented with. And 40 odd nationalities of the world were already together, even today, there are 3,300 people in Oroville, a significant number coming from all over the world, inspired by Sri and the mother, still there, and a large section of the Tamil population, which is local, in that arid desert land called Oroville, and who slowly, many of them, got integrated into the community experiment. So this is what happened. The other thing that happened very, very significantly was the... You know, it was when I went to Oroville in 1968, and Shantadi would also remember, it was just like the Thar Desert of Rajasthan. It was absolutely arid. There was just one banyan tree which stood in the middle of miles of desert. Today, Oroville is one of the greenest places in India. It is a great example of man-made afforestation. India is a great country of deforestation. Here is an affirmative example of afforestation. 
It's a great, great thing that has happened. It's also a haven for alternative energy. The, the, we were talking about the kitchen. The center of Oroville is a solar kitchen. It runs on solar energy. And there are other examples of alternative building material. They've worked with wind energy. They've worked with, in fact, the, the, the trees of Oroville are relatively young. When tsunami happened, the trees got knocked down and they did a unique experiment with furniture, but not knocking down trees, but the trees that already fell during the tsunami. So there's organic farming as well, and they have a unique experiment. Oroville has worked successfully and but to a limited extent with a cashless economy. We have to understand that even during Tagore's lifetime, his own vision that he implemented in Shanti Nikitan did not easily and fully reach out outside Shanti Nikitan, say to Calcutta. The students who were educated here had to take extra classes in order to continue university education in Shanti Nikitan. And those extra classes were what we call today tuition classes, coaching classes, not according to Tagore's vision of playful education and so on, and uh, including the music, including art, etc., but simply learning the stuff in order to pass an examination. So uh, the, this is already one answer that Tagore's vision of education can be implemented outside Chantinikita, even during his lifetime, only partially. But what one should really hold on to are these two elements which are mentioned, namely creativity and freedom. Now, creativity has no limits. You can get it even in formal education. Freedom too. The teacher is the one and the institutional head is the one who defines how much freedom the student can get and should get and also use it. Many students in India don't want to use their freedom. They are quite comfortable to be guided, to be held to their hand and carry on like that. Yeah. So if all the t students in all the classes and schools in India could put before them these two words and then push the limits, then I think Tagore would set a great example. We are still in the beginning. Sridip, I have a slightly different but related question for you. Yeah. Uh, you talked about the ashram being a political community. And uh, you also talked about how it stopped calling itself an ashram. Now, Sabarmati has not existed as an ashram for decades now, many decades. And uh, yet Sabarmati plays a very important role role within the national community. I'm talking about the national community. So uh, we'd been talking about uh, the vision of, edu a vision of education and the community being linked to each other. You were director of Sabarmati Ashram for several years in between when you brought in certain transformations or you brought in certain changes. Could you talk a little about what you were trying to do then in order to have the ashram relate to the modern world and contribute to the modern world in significant ways through its archives, through its resources, and through its history. So how did you try to develop these links between the ashram and contemporary scholarship and contemporary education? Um, thank you, Kavita. What was I trying to do at the ashram? Um, well, I was trying to have fun. Um, you know, um, what does one do at the ashram? What we need to understand is that the ashram when Gandhi leaves it in 1930s, um, is a large 130 acres of land. What I was managing as a real estate manager was a sliver of that land, 3.5 acres. And if you took up, you know, took the road in between, it became five acres. It's a uh, what one was looking at was a memorial rather than the ashram. So one has to 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 be clear that what what remains is a memorial. And the function of the memorial was a two, twofold and when it was created. One was to look at the built heritage uh, and the built heritage was interpreted as only the built heritage of that community. But was the other charter was really to make 
the resources of that center, which has a large library and one of the la world's largest archive of Gandhi's original writings available to, to the people of the world. And, and that's really what I sought to do, which is to modernize the library in the, in the way that a library should function, uh, that the catalogs need to be complete, the catalogs need to be online, they need to be searchable. So it's, it's, it's a kind of a housekeeping function that one, one was required to do. The other thing that uh, was that um, you needed to build an archive, uh, uh, both which was secure, but which is also uh, state of the art in terms of uh, what a scholar would expect from any archive anywhere in the world. And that's really the second attempt. The third attempt was to reach out to, uh, to other centers because one could actually look at uh, notions of architecture and design that went beyond uh, Ahmedabad and went, let's say, um, you know, what happens when what happens to notions of building and habitat when Gandhi and the community moves to Sevagram? Uh, how does Gandhi inhabit a prison? Uh, these are the kind of questions that we had, and that was another thing that we sought to do. Uh, and third, most important in Ahmedabad, you have to run a shop. Um, um, you know, I mean, if you're not a petty shopkeeper, nobody in Ahmedabad takes you seriously. So finally, I found my vocation and said, I need to be a petty shopkeeper, have a good bookshop, a museum shop, so uh, we did that. So yes, it, it, it was around three things, really importantly, the library, the archive, and making the visitor experience uh, a pleasant experience. Um, and the pleasant experience needs clean toilets, needs uh, a good shop for you from where you buy things, which represent something of the ethos of the place, but also of the larger social endeavor. So that's what I, I did for the duration that I was there. Um, I, I think I overstayed my welcome, but, uh, you know, these things happen to all of us. And they're sometimes very slow to take hints. Thank you, Sridhar. Uh, Ranjan, your turn, please. So, you know, we've been um, we we like talking it. about this uh, presentation earlier. Since you're also a management person, oh. <laughs> what keeps communities going? What keeps communities active? You know, communities have a founding vision, but the world changes. Yes. So how do you hold the community together? How do you act like a midwife to enable the transformations of the community? What, what is it that keeps the community going? I'm not saying how does one person do it, but what keeps the community going? How does I, one I think the, the answer to that would be any for any community. It would be a kind of living faith of the people who subscribe in that to that community or a significant part of that community we need to have a living faith in the vision and, and let's say what the founder said and to subscribe to that spirit, not only in terms of a mental affiliation, but in one's own life. If one is willing to practice that, the idea and the thought with which I came into the community all through my life and a majority of the people or a significant number of the people are willing to do that, the community is successful. It's been changing times. Yes. The People may share a faith, yes, but they may have very, very different views and opinions. Absolutely. What kinds of negotiations go on? What uh, what kind of <laughs> dynamics are set in? Place? Those are very difficult. Those are very difficult because the interpretations of the original vision are very different. But if one has a faith in the founder, and we mentioned the word ashram earlier, so if that founder is somebody who has, in some way, been seen as a spiritual person, then you would believe that power is there. So you subscribe to that as a living faith, as I said. And the negotiation is something that is between brothers. It is not between enemies. It's easier said than done. So you would say that faith <laughs> is the key to what Absolutely. Is. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So I'll very quickly run through this. You know, this is because I think the Oroville chart is a very unique document in itself. So this is what the mother said, and you see her handwriting here, which is precious. And it's in French, but you know, the translation is also given. And, but you see in the first slide, when she says Auroville belongs to humanity as a whole, she says to live in Auroville, one must be a living servitor of the divine consciousness. So we find an echo of the ashram spirit, which Martin was referring to, if you will. So then you see the word education coming in now. So that's what I say, place of an unended, unending education of constant progress. And progress, of course, as you said, situation changes, 
time changes, constant progress, and a youth that never uh, ages. So Auroville intends to be young. So bridge between the past and the future. So not glorifying necessarily the past, but looking forward towards the future and all it, taking advantages of all discoveries from without and within, Auroville will boldly spring towards future realizations. And a site of material and spiritual researches for a living embodiment of an actual human unity. Okay, so we're opening this up to the audience. I'm sure you'll have questions, queries, maybe even disagreements, challenges. It's yours now. The floor is yours. Look here, I'm one of the examples of the answer that I want to give you. Obviously, Vishwarati and Shantaniketan are two different entities. Vishwarati is the community of those who are working within the university. Shantiniketan in campus and Sinikitan, and Shantiniketan is the community all around the university. Those who are either attached to the university but not employed, or who have come because they like the ideals and ideas of Rabindranath and want to live in his light and in his shadow. I say I am one of the examples because the school that has been founded in the villages eight, 10 kilometers away among the Chantal community have been founded by me with my friends on the lines of Rabindranath's ideas of education, work, uh, education, learning through playing, learning through music, learning through arts, learning through theater and dance. And this, the Chantal community is absolutely ideal to exemplify this because their life is dance and music and songs. So they have the greatest possibility to have these ideals put into practice. We can take one question more. Yeah, please, Urvish. So um, you said it's a pact of brothers. I imagine you mean brothers and sisters, but you just forgot to mention the sisters. So I'm just reminding you. Um, but my question here is we are listening to three very different models. And I'm interested in the Auroville model because it is a living, um, compact, a closed community, if you like. Uh, and I'm interested in the managerial aspects of that. I mean, what happens to a member of the community who wants to rebel, who will start rapping about how he or she hates the community and how everything's wrong in it? Who has the authority to throw somebody, a community member out or hold them in? Because what you described as a kind of self-belief and self-subscription to a model is wonderful, but surely there are cracks. And what happens when the cracks happen? Okay, I'll try to answer. But you see, when uh, Kavita asked me the question, she said about a community, ideally about a community. She didn't say or Orville, you know, in particular. So in the years that followed, what happened was that uh, because probably of a large foreign population, because of the fact that, you know, the complexity of the fact that there were so many nationalities, and the central figure, physical figure of the mother missing, willy-nilly, it finally, an Auroville Foundation Act was passed in Parliament, which you're aware of. And the government took charge in principle of the outer administration of Auroville. So today, there is an Auroville administrator who is an IAS officer. There's also an international advisory council and a residence assembly. But the rebellion, and, and you're seeing some of it of late, that you have seen, there was, um, there was something around felling of trees and subscribing to a master plan. Let me put it this way. So far, very few coercive steps have been taken from the Oroville administration over the years. Whether that will change in the days to come remains to be seen. It's... There's too much rich material here. There's too much history to be discussed. But I think for the too little time, whatever you did manage to put in, all three of you, thank you very much. And I'll you know, uh, thank all of you for being here too.